Hello everybody, uh, Dave Van Horn here. Welcome to my live call. Actually, um, it's a beautiful day in Overcast in Philadelphia. Uh, welcome. And um, today our topic's going to be how to get started in notes. And I know last week we actually, uh, we covered some different things. We talked about how how to buy notes in real estate without banks and money. So hopefully uh, some of you are joining us today. Um, I know last time we had folks from all over. Um, by all means, you know, give me a shout out, mention to me where you're coming from. Uh, if you have any comments or questions, be sure to ask them. And um, like I said last week, we were talking about buying notes in real estate without banks and money. It actually comes, um, that topic actually came from chapter six and seven of my new book, Real Estate Note Investing. And, um, you know, a lot of things we covered there were uh, things like owner financing. Uh, we talked a lot about lease options. We went into some subject to investing. And, uh, you know, most subject to cases are usually a situation where someone's headed to foreclosure or it might be a case where they have no equity, that type of thing. Because I know a lot of people ask the question, like, why would someone allow you to take over their mortgage um, and give you the deed? And, and um, you know, why would someone do that, right? So they're, they're typically those scenarios. And then we even talked about other people's money, OPM. And in those cases, it's, you know, where you're utilizing private money and, you um, I think the neat part there is it's not your money. So it's, your, yes, it takes money to do deals sometimes, but it doesn't always have to be our own money, that type of thing. So, um, you know, they're just some of the things we talked about uh, last time. And today, um, you know, how to get started in notes. That, that, that question comes up to me all the time, especially on bigger pockets. People are asking, you know, hey, I just read the book. Um, I really enjoyed it. How do I get started? What, you know, what can I do? What are my next steps? Those types of things. And I think, you know, no matter what it is that you're getting started in, there's probably three main things. It, it's to get educated in the space a little bit, to network with some other folks who are doing the business. And if you can, find a mentor, sometimes a coach, could be a JV partner, could be someone you can shadow a deal with, that type of thing. So, you know, I actually uh, think back to when I got started and some of the things that I did, it probably, I know I, know I actually covered in the book in, in like chapter four, I think it was, where I go into, you know, how I got started in notes. And a lot of it for me, um, was probably about 2003, I went in to join my local RIA group, my Real Estate Investor Association. And the reason I was going there, uh, up until that point, I was kind of a, you know, I already had a lot of property, not a lot, like 10 or 15, I forget now. And, um, you know, I had been a real estate agent for probably, you know, 15 years, something like that. And, you know, I, I was kind of like, I didn't network very well. I didn't network much at all. And I, I was more of a, I don't want to say a know-it-all kind of guy, but it was like I renovated my own property. I kind of stayed to myself. I didn't really check in to see what other people were doing, that type of thing. But I hit a wall and the wall that I hit was financing. And I was pretty much tapped out. No one would really lend me any more money. I couldn't couldn't do any more deals with traditional financing. So I was kind of hitting this brick wall. And I remember going into the, the local re real estate investor association and, you know, friends had told me about it. I just never did it. I never thought about really networking with other investors. But once I was hitting this financing hurdle where I couldn't get any uh, capital to do more deals, I was like, well, how are all these other people doing it? So I, so I joined a group. I was really just looking for capital. And when I went there, they would have like a main meeting on the last Thursday of the month or whatever. And the following Saturday, a lot of times they'd have a speaker come in. So I kind of made the commitment to myself. You know, I joined, paid a yearly membership fee or whatever. I was like, you know what? I'm going to go to these things. And even if I don't, you know, do much with it, I'm going to just be a sponge. I'm going to soak it all in and 
meet as many people as I can and, and learn about uh, all kinds of creative financing and alternative uh, ways to invest, that type of thing. And the very first speaker that I heard was a guy named Jimmy Napier. Uh, and he was the author of Invest in Debt, which just happened to be fate, right? That I actually saw him as my initial speaker. And of course, I didn't do anything. You know, I went to the class, thought it was intrigued. I didn't even know about notes. He was, he was actually teaching uh, about the seller finance note business. And, you know, later on, I got to see many other people teach that concept. Uh, you know, Donna Bauer, Pete Fortunato, Jack Miller. And, um, you know, I hadn't learned anything about that up until that point. So it was a really great experience for me uh, to see that. And then, you know, later on, I, uh, even learned about, you know, pr doing private money and, uh, you know, I started, uh, borrowing some private money. I remember my cousin lending me money to do deals. And I actually talk about that in the book. I do a, a pretty good case study, um, in the book. So, you know, I go into why, you know, in the case of my cousin, how advantageous it was just to borrow money and pay points and the interest rate that it was to partner with my own cousin, which, um, you know, I know a lot of people hit that crossroad. Do I partner with somebody or do I just borrow the money? So um, I know I cover that in the book. Uh, like I said, if you haven't gotten a copy yet, you can go to biggerpockets.com forward slash note investing. In fact, today we're going to have a 20% uh, off uh, code and it's live note investing, all one word, live note investing to get 20% off the book. And I do a pretty drawn, you know, through case study of what I did with my cousin. And I show you both sides of if I had JV'd with them versus whether I had just borrowed the money. So it's a great case study. And like I said, if you get this on Bigger Pockets, there's also some bonus material. Uh, stay safe. There's an ebook, uh, How to Stay Safe. Uh, and then the other one, it, it, we have a video that I did with Brandon on how to actually go out and purchase a, a, a note and go buy a note. Uh, on a website, we analyze the note. Me and my partner Bob walk Brandon through, you know, some of the due diligence we would do, things we would look at, that type of thing. Some real hands-on stuff as to what you would do if you're looking to buy a note. And then also, there's a uh, another bonus is uh, a thing we did on asset protect with asset protection attorney Mary Hart on some of the biggest mistakes investors make. So I think that's a great audio as well. So those bonus materials are, yeah, in some ways they're priceless, uh, especially keeping you out of trouble or saving you some grief down the road, that type of thing. But back to, um, you know, the seller financing piece, that's how I initially was introduced to the note space and then doing private money and, you know, me borrowing private money and then me lending out private money. And I had even done some through my IRA, that type of thing. But then, um, you know, I guess the next thing that happened to for me was I um, had started my own investment group, uh, my own networking group, which was called Ring Real Estate Investor Networking Group. And you know, I like networking so much. I started my own group with my own network and a couple professionals. I put together an accountant, attorney, an IRA company, um, you know, that type of thing, and myself. I was a realtor at the time. And we shared our networks and we brought all our friends and we did deals and ate dinner together and all that type of thing. And uh, it really grew and grew and grew. And one of the things that happened was um, I started getting into commercial real estate and I started doing some mobile home deals. And we were utilizing notes there to buy mobile home parks with owner financing or with, um, you know, one time we took over a subject to deal on four mobile home parks where we took over the financing that was already in place. And we added, uh, you know, a lot of times we would put a second mortgage on, on a mobile home park, that type of thing. And then we even did mobile home financing for people that were actually trying to buy the mobile homes themselves. So we, we kind of became our own little mini bank, so to speak, with private capital and, uh, you know, raising the private capital, lending it out to folks to buy mobile homes from us, to put in our parks, to increase the value of the parks. So did a lot of neat things like that. And um, so, you know, then we went into, um, you know, just after I was getting into the commercial notes, this was all happening while I was running this ring group. 
And then later on, uh, one of my roles at Ring was to interview speakers to come to our events, right? And at one point I was interviewing um, some folks out of New York who were raising capital for institutional notes. And that's kind of how I got into that institutional note space. Um, you know, someone came down to my group, they spoke, they were actually raising capital to buy pools of distressed mortgages uh, out of New York City. And, um, you know, of course they came, they spoke, it sounded great. And of course, again, I didn't do anything, but my partner, John, did. He invested some capital, uh, made some good returns. And the next thing you know, um, Right before the downturn in uh, 2007, we reached out to those folks and said, hey, if you show us how to collect on delinquent assets, you know, we'll buy some product from you. And uh, they agreed and they showed us the ropes a little bit. And uh, next thing you know, we were out buying non-performing notes. So, you know, I don't know if you guys are liking what you're hearing. If so, give me some thumbs up and uh, uh, hopefully you're enjoying this. The uh, the interesting thing about uh, the institutional notes at first was, you know, we didn't start out big. We were just like anybody else. You know, we were wearing all the hats. We were doing everything ourselves. Um, and in the beginning, it was our own capital. We only bought four notes. And I remember, um, you know, when we were doing that, the, um, you know, one was a grand slam, one was a home run. And two of them we lost money on. So if two of the notes were the ones we lost money on, you know, I probably wouldn't be talking to you today, you know. So, um, you know, an interesting thing that, you know, that happened there along the way. So you never know how this, uh, this thing's going to pan out, right? So um, in the very beginning, I was an asset manager. And, you know, I was, um, you know, calling borrowers, that type of thing. And it was a different time and place back then. Later on, you know, I played several different roles, and at one point I became the fundraiser, that type of thing, and that, that became my primary role was raising capital over time. But in the very beginning, this whole idea of specialty servicing, uh, which is what it is when you're collecting on non-performing notes, and um, it wasn't as regulated as it is today. Uh, today, it's a lot more... Uh, licensing being required. Uh, a lot of states require uh, a buy and hold license, and there's even a couple states that require a license to sell. Like for example, Florida and Wisconsin require uh, you know a, a license to sell. Some of the buy and hold states are you know there's actually quite a few of them now: Alabama, Connecticut, Georgia, Illinois, Kansas, Kentucky, uh, Maryland, Minnesota, uh, Mississippi. New Jersey, West Virginia, I mean, there's quite a few of them now where you need a license just to buy and hold a note. And I think, um, you know, a lot of note buyers, they might be aware of the regulatory risk today, the compliance risk. So it is a completely different world. And, you know, I don't want to see anybody get hurt doing it. I mean, there's definitely ways to do the non-performing note business safely uh, in a better way. And I think... Um, I think it's just having that knowledge, you know, what's required. I know there's uh, ACAinternational.org is a, a website that you can join to find out all the licensing requirements in all 50 states for a nominal fee. The, um, but like I said, we started in junior liens, second mortgages, and there was a lot of differences between, um, you know, how you did uh, your due diligence even, and even your philosophy. I know with junior liens, we typically exit through the borrower. With uh, senior liens, we're exiting through the property, that type of thing. So your sometimes your exits are different. Uh, sometimes your, your, your due diligence is definitely different. I know with first liens, a lot of times we're looking at back taxes, HOA fees, uh, liens against the property. Uh, with junior liens, it's more about... Um, you know, we're looking at credit report to more or less verify the status of the senior lien. So we don't look at the same things. You know, we might pull title on a first lien uh, or try to get a BPO, broker price opinion, where we're trying to determine value. Whereas a junior lien, we're not as concerned as much. Um, we're more, more concerned with senior lien status is actually more important to us than the actual value of the property. So, um, same way when we do um, a modification, uh, a lot of times with uh, first liens, we're looking at back taxes, those types of things. 
but with a junior lien, we might be more focused on arrears and uh, missed payments, that type of thing. So it's uh, obviously with both of them though, we're, you're, you're definitely uh, concerned about foreclosure timelines and the costs, right? So how long is it gonna take in a particular state? So there's a lot more rolling up your sleeves with non-performing notes and figuring out what to do and how to get it done. Um, so, you know, how to do it safely. If I think about the non-performing note business, I think the safest ways are probably to focus on, you know, equity deals, for example. Um, if a deal has plenty of equity, uh, it protects your investment, right? Because it's the collateral behind your investment. So if you want a really safe deal, make sure you have a deal that has a lot of equity to it. Another way, if you're doing junior liens, is to you know, try to get a loan where uh, it's current on the first mortgage because that's going to have mo a better likelihood of a favorable outcome. You know, I had a, 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 you know, years ago when we first started in 2007, um, we didn't really have a market to sell our notes, right? It was, there just wasn't a, a big market like there is today. Um, but, so we kind of created one by teaching it. And, you know, later on, of course, we stopped teaching because, you know, mostly due to compliance risk and that type of thing. But the, you know, we recognized early on that it was a learn by doing business. And we used to um, utilize practice notes, which is something somebody starting today could do. They could go buy, you know, an inexpensive note, place it with a licensed servicer and work an inexpensive note with no real uh, plan to make a lot of money. But it, it would give them the opportunity to uh, perhaps uh, learn the business, learn how to record it, see it, touch it, feel it, um, and, and, and kind of learn how to do it where it doesn't matter much because you don't have a lot of money tied up in that deal. And that's a great way to do it too. Um, one of the um, one of uh, buddy of mine who started out in the business, he he went out and he bought uh, like ten really inexpensive notes for a nominal fee and. Um, you know, he was just practicing on that pool of 10 notes and, and believe it or not, one of them was a grand slam and a couple others he made a little bit of money on, more than got back his money and then he was off and running and learning the business and felt good about it. So there are some safe ways to try to get started in the business. So, you know, hopefully you like what I'm talking about. If you get a chance, give me a share, give me a like. Uh, if you like the book, Bigger Pockets, uh, on biggerpockets.com forward slash note investing book on real estate note investing. If you like what you're reading, please give me a review. That's the ultimate compliment. Um, but anyhow, um, I think after, you know, non-performing notes, I, I think the big question we get is, um, you know, what's better, performing notes or investing in a note fund, right? That's a big question we get all the time. What do you like better? And I know with performing notes, I, I think the real question comes down to, you know, what type of investor are you? Um, are you active? Are you passive? Um, how much time do you have to invest? How much risk are you willing to take? That type of thing. And, you know, what's your experience level? What's your, um, sometimes even what's your age? What's your horizon? Uh, are you using IRA money? Th those types of things. So I know, um, you know, there's all kinds of things going on with that. So keep that in mind. There's some, uh, you know, really great things to consider when you're thinking of what type of investor are you? Uh, you know, what's your risk tolerance? Uh, you know, is it, is it your last nickel? That type of thing. So, so it, it, it's all important. And I think it dictates how people can get started and how people want to start to invest because you, you want to do it safely, you want to do it the right way. Um, you don't want to take too much risk on that, that kind of thing. So I think it's important to kind of know yourself, know what type of investor you really are. Um, otherwise, you, you know, you're running this risk of, uh, you know, is that what you really, you know, you want to be careful, right? You, you don't want to uh, get into trouble. But with performing notes, uh, I know when people are asking me which is, you know, which do I think is better, it's kind of like, um, it, you know, a lot of times it comes, is there, what kind of reps and warrants are come with the note? Who's your note seller? How well do you know the note seller? Uh, I think that's really important. 
Um, the, you know, if I'm buying a performing note, yeah, I might be looking at equity. Um, knowing your note seller is pretty important too because you, you want to make sure you're getting your collateral. You're not done your transaction uh, necessarily at closing, right? You could, you might need a future assignment or you might need a document that's missing or, uh, so that's why you want to kind of have these reps and warrants in place from a reputable note seller if you can do that. Um, if you're, as far as note funds, I, I think the big advantage to investing in a note fund is that you have, one is you have diversification. Uh, you also have limited liability. Uh, when you invest in a note, you're pretty much liable if something goes wrong or somebody you hire does something wrong, like they, you know, they violate a fair debt collection law or something like that. You could be on the hook for that and you could be fined or sued for more money than you purchased the note for. Whereas if you're in a note fund, that can't really happen. Your, your biggest exposure would be uh, how much uh, money you had invested, right? That type of thing. So, uh, hey, how you guys doing? Oh, somebody from Chad, I think it is, from Oklahoma City. What's up, Chad? Hey, Aaron. Hey, Martin. I know I'm not uh, saying hello to everybody. Sandra, Ron, Barry. Uh, it's great to see everybody on the call. Um, so, you know, I'm talking about what's better, performing notes or note funds. I mean, the advantage to, you know, performing notes, uh, you know, here's a great question. People ask me that and I go, they go, which is better? And I, I answer them, I go, I don't know. That's why I do both. <laughs> um, I, I think the advantage to performing notes is that you're in control. You own the asset. Um, and also, sometimes your yield could go up if you got an early payoff. So, so you kind of don't know what you're going to make on a deal till you exit the deal. So, one of the things that's kind of neat about uh, you know investing in a performing note or is if somebody pays you off early because all of a sudden your yield goes through the roof, right? So that's pretty cool. The um, with a note fund, you're investing in the management um, management team that you know is working the portfolio of notes. I mean, you do have the advantage of being diversified, that type of thing, which could be good, right? Because you're, um, you know, you're able to spread your risk around. Like if I own one note and it goes, it defaults on me, I have a 100% default rate, right? If I have 10 notes and one note defaults, I have a 10% default rate. And if I have 100 notes and one note defaults, I have a 1% default rate. So you can see sometimes the biggest risk in the note business is the amount of capital you have diversified into the marketplace, right? That's really your the risk is that you don't have enough uh, capital deployed, which is, um, you know, that's what the banks do, right? Banks don't worry about uh, which state they invest in, right? They invest, you know, Bank of America is going to invest in all 50 states and all the U.S. territories because they have a lot of capital deployed throughout the marketplace and they spread their risk around, whereas the smaller note buyer you know, can't really do that. And, uh, you know, a lot of times I say that to people, the biggest risk in the note business is you. Um, and it's because of you don't have enough capital into the marketplace. And it kind of makes sense if you think about it, because the default rate on mortgages has pretty much been pretty consistent other than that big downturn that we had. Hey, Martin, appreciate the shout out. I'm from Texas. All right. Um, so, you know, big differences between, you know, how you can you know end up exiting those deals so if you have confidence in the management team of the note fund and you feel good about being diversified your liability is limited now there's different types of note funds and that's uh something you got to be aware of right some note funds like you know our note funds you have to be a high net worth accredited investor so the note funds aren't really open to just anyone although anyone can buy a note right so that's another advantage to investing in the notes themselves now, there are some note funds that allow what's, what I call sophisticated investors. Uh, sometimes they allow up to 35 of them in a fund. I know there's funds out there that do that. I know my buddy uh, Bob Malecki, he's on Bigger Pockets a lot. He has a fund where unaccredited folks can invest. Um, you know, they, can, they have to be a sophisticated investor, which means they're pretty savvy in the investment itself that you know they're aware of what it is they know how it works they've done it before that type of thing um, and another um type of note fund is crowdfunding uh i don't know i'm trying to think who does crowdfunding there's you know it's like a realty shares patch of land type i know i believe it was ahp um 
did crowdfunding for delinquent notes and the minimum investment was very low. It was open to pretty much anyone could invest in that fund. So there's, you know, different types of funds available out there that people can get started in. Uh, like I said, the lowest I've seen on the note fund side was around $100 um, for secured mortgages, right? Uh, so that's something else to be aware of. There are peer-to-peer -peer groups um, also available too. Some people get started in, P uh, which would be, you know, like the lending clubs and the prosper.coms, but they're usually not mortgages. They're usually unsecured debt. I know lending club is typically... You know, it's mostly credit card debt, that type of thing. And I think the way people diversify there is they invest a small amount of money in a lot of different deals. So their exposure is spread amongst a lot of deals. Now, I've played around myself a little bit uh, in, in a lending club type uh, an outfit. There's Prosper.com. There's many of those. Um, the only challenge I found was I do pretty well. I make a, an okay return, but it's not super high. Uh, and it is tough to like liquidate or get out of that. So I think my... I guess best advice there is don't put too much exposure into something like that uh, because it might not be as liquid as you think it is, that type of thing. The, speaking of liquidity, if you invest in a note, though, there's a lot of uh, ways to recapitalize recap that are probably much easier than trying to recapitalize. Uh, you know, if you have shares of a note, it's not like you can sell it. You know, when you invest in a note fund, you're investing in shares of a non-publicly traded company. So it's not like you can sell your shares on the stock exchange, right? But when you own a note, notes are pretty liquid. Um, you know, I've been known to sell a note in less than 15 minutes. You can also sell a partial of a note. You don't have to sell the whole note. You can borrow against the note. So when it comes to liquidity, I would have to believe that the note themselves are actually more liquid uh, and you actually own the asset, right? So, um, you know, an interesting, uh, you know, it's just a different uh, investment. You know, some people say, um, you know, they tend to think they're, you know, identical or something. They're not. One, you're investing in shares of a non-publicly traded company. You're really investing in that management team, their track record, their history, their performance, um, that type of thing. When you invest in the note, um, now it's, you know, you got to do your due diligence on the asset and the property behind the paperwork. Um, I know when we're looking at, you know, things like notes, we we look at like four main areas when we're doing the due diligence. Uh, the four main areas in the note business to us are the administration, risk management, borrow management, and exits. And I know from the administration side, um, you know, it's, it's internal and external, right? So your internal administration could be, you know, you got your loan delivered to you after you purchased it. You know, you're going to onboard your, uh, you know, information about your borrower that type of thing you know depending on whether you're working the asset yourself or you're going to upload it into your software or you're going to have a servicer do it now i recommend strongly that people get a servicer when they're doing that um when it comes to so you have internal administration and external administration i know the external administration is things like uh when you go to um yeah, you, know, you got to get your assignment recorded, that type of thing. That's external administration where I'm sending out a document to get recorded to protect my investment, right? So those things are important. Um, the uh, and then there's the other parts of the business, borrower management, where it's really you're trying to determine what's the borrower intent. If I buy a non-performing note, what, you know, what do they intend to do, that type of thing. Um, and then what's what do I think my exit will be? But the um, you know, there's definitely differences in this type of due diligence when you're, there's differences in due diligence when you're buying performing versus non-performing as well. I know when I'm buying a performing note, I'm looking at things more like um, pay history or I'm looking at value. I might even pull credit to see if their credit's improving. Those types of things are more important to me. I know, um, you know, especially with first mortgages, I know that there's a big advantage to having some boots on the ground and some eyeballs on the property. Uh, one of the books I love was David Green's book, uh, Investing Out of State, where you, you know, very insightful because in the note business, a lot of times you're investing in other areas. You don't have to necessarily invest in your neck of the woods. I know uh, in the beginning, a lot of people do that. They want to invest in notes that are right down the street so they can drive by it and look at it or look in the windows or whatever they're trying to do but you quickly learn that that doesn't really matter um 
because most nodes you're not getting inside the property anyway. So it's, it's done, a good bit of it's done by computer and phone and uh, sending folks by the property, that type of thing, and uh, utilizing digital and photos and that type of thing. The, um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, there's definitely some advantages and disadvantages to performing notes and note funds, that type of thing. Uh, they vary, right? So the, I guess, so, you know, we talked about a lot of things, right? Just to recap, I talked about how I got started, uh, how I worked my way up through, um, you know, seller finance notes and then got into institutional notes, uh, well, commercial notes, then institutional notes, then got into, you know, into the non-performing note world, which, you know, it's, you know, it's not for the faint of heart, especially today. It's a lot different environment than it was years ago. I do want to, you know, definitely strongly reiterate that it, it, you got to know what you're doing in the NPN space, the non-performing note space. Um, but there are ways to do it. There are ways to invest safely. Uh, I did touch on licensing and some due diligence, that type of thing. Uh, knowing your note seller, these are really important types of things. Um, and then if you want to invest in performing notes or note funds, which is mostly what I do, um, uh, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily like to do, uh, personally, I don't do NPN business when I go home at night or anything. And, um, I guess if you can't find a note, you can always, you know, you can't find a note to buy, you can always create one. And, you know, that's back to the private money thing. Um, I know, you know, a lot of times people go, oh, there's no notes to buy. It's like saying there's no houses to find. Uh, there's no deals to find. You know, I was just talking to a good buddy yesterday and he was telling me, you know, I said to him, I said, I hear it's a little tight out there. And he goes, no, I'm still finding deals. I got to work a little harder. Uh, but he's an experienced guy. He, you know, him and his wife understand what they, they got to roll up their sleeves. They got to be a little more efficient. Um, there's equity in the marketplace. It's a different market. You have to change your tax tactics. Um, very similar in the note space. Um, direct correlation to real estate values. The same thing happens in an up real estate market. There's fewer notes to buy, but you just have to adjust and you have to be a little more efficient. Uh, you have to be a little, uh, tighter in how you find product and how you work assets. You gotta be, you know, like I said, you gotta be more efficient. There's not as much room for error. Uh, in, in tighter deals with, you know, a little bit tighter margins sometimes. But I think um, the thing I like about the note business is if you can't find a note, you can create one, right? So, um, and that's where I think, you know, private money can come in and you can actually, you know, it's, to me, I think private money is much safer if I'm lending to someone's LLC for say a rehab project. To me, that's much safer than me creating a mortgage for an owner occupant because it's the owner occupied borrower where all the regulatory compliance comes in and that's where all the laws are written for. Most of the laws aren't really, it's almost like they don't give too much of a concern to businesses and entities like they do individual families in the, you know, especially in the one to four family residential arena. And you can see that in lending practices, the lending requirements are much different for commercial notes versus, uh, residential, right? So big difference in that. And I think, um, I think if you're going to do private notes though, or get involved in lending money for a private note, uh, private deal, I think you got to be really careful there. I think, you know, I, I definitely have some rules of the road for that. I do talk about that in the book, real estate note investing. Um, if you go to biggerpockets.com forward slash note investing, get 20% off. If you type in the code, live note investing you get 20 percent off it's all one word live note investing i think i wrote it on the board behind me i don't know if you can see it kind of hard to see but anyhow um you know by all means go there if you haven't picked it up uh some great bonus material available as well stay safe the ebook uh the video we did with brandon on how to buy a note we actually go to websites to look at due diligence to look at things we look at we talk about it um, what notes we would buy and why we like them and why we don't like them. And then, um, some asset protection stuff with Mary Hart, great audio there as well. So if you have a chance, pick it up, you know, give me some thumbs up, give me a review, give me some comments, ask me some questions. Um, but the, 
back to these private note conditions, I do want to touch on that a little bit because I think sometimes I see people, if they get into a little bit of trouble and you know, you don't want to see anybody get into trouble. Hey, Tony. Hey, hello. And I see Casey finally made it on. Um, let me see. Mark. Mark's from Smithfield, Virginia and Heath from Alabama, Birmingham. Actually, Birmingham's a cool place. Um, who else do we got here? Tony and Joe. North Carolina in the house. Uh, yes, the code is live. Note investing, all one word, if you want to pick up the book. So I'm glad you guys are on. Hopefully you guys are getting something out of this, learning some stuff. Um, I know it's fun for me to put these on. And it's a great way for me to connect uh, directly with you guys. I, I, I like that. So um, private loan conditions. I mean, I'm not saying these are all of them or it's an all comprehensive list, but... I do talk about that in the book as well because uh, I had done some private lending and um, I love using OPM, other people's money. And I, you know, that was one of the things I talked about last week is I like to use, um, you know, I like to keep my capital invested in, you know, note deals, hard money, that type of thing, passive stuff that's liquid that I can get my hands on. And then if I need money for, well, you know, I try to do my real estate deals with none of my own money, right? I try to do, so I'm trying to do owner financing subject to lease options, or I'm using private money to, uh, you know, do a BRR strategy, you know, the, uh, you know, buy, rent, uh, renovate, fix up, rent out, you know the deal. They call it Burr, or back in the day, we just called it a rehab deal that you fixed up and flipped or whatever. But anyhow, the... Um, you know, I like to do that with other people's money and I can do twice as many deals and build twice as much wealth, twice as vast, right? So I like to, uh, you know, do that type of thing. I don't like to tie up my own capital in deals when I don't need to, right? I can use other people's money to do the real estate deals and use my money to do, you know, no deals and hard money deals, private money deals. But back to this private um, lending thing, because I know I see a lot of people get in trouble with it. And I think there's definitely some things you got to consider, especially when you're starting out. And, you know, everybody's new. I was new at one point. But one of them is obviously you got to know the numbers. Does the deal work that you're lending on? Or, you know, even if you're borrowing, you want to make sure that it works, right? I know a lot of times people say, well, I don't have a big money list. Um, what should I do? Well, you know, a hard money lender is expensive. But the one thing is they'll only lend on a deal. If it's not a true deal, they're not lending it to you. And you can learn a lot about the numbers that they look at because those numbers kind of make sense of whether you have a real deal or not. It's kind of like the bank, right? Uh, and the reason I bring up the bank is the paperwork side of things. And I think in the beginning, especially if you're the lender, you want to get papered up right. You want to get your attorney. You definitely want to have a title company involved. You definitely want to pull a title. You want to make sure you button this thing up right. Right? You want to make sure you have your collateral intact. You want to make sure you have a note, a mortgage, a deed in lieu of foreclosure set up. Right? Sometimes there's an escrow. It depends on your state. Right? You want to have a power of attorney. You want to have a confession of judgment. You want to have draw schedules. Right? And in the beginning, you're just not aware of what all these things are, and they can vary a little bit from state to state. Um, I know, like in my state of Pennsylvania, I can't uh, record a deed, like I say I have a deed in escrow, uh, uh, a deed in lieu drawn up. I can't record that unless they're delinquent 60 days. Then I'm able to record that and circumvent the foreclosure process. That's the whole advantage of having a deed in lieu signed, right? So if I'm, and usually I'm only lending to an LLC. If you don't have an LLC, I'm not doing a loan for you. That's really the case there. Now I only lend up to about 65% of value. Now, the, get this, the paperwork that you need, you might be going, oh, I got to get a lawyer uh, to draw up the paperwork. But here's the thing, the borrower usually pays that cost. That's usually passed on to the borrower. So I wouldn't sweat that. I would get the borrower to pick up that tab, just like if I need an appraisal. Now, for me, luckily, most of the areas I lent to were I knew the borrower. They were friends of mine. They were very experienced because you do want to know the borrower. You want to make sure their experience level. You might want to do some due diligence on the borrower if you don't know them. Right, you want to make sure they're not a bad actor. Um, personally, I don't do a lot with um, newbies, really, because I have plenty of experienced investors that you know want capital that are friends of mine. Right? Why would I lend to someone who has no experience at all? I'm just taking too much risk, unnecessary risk in in that case. Now, if you're new, I get it. I was new too, but you could have an experienced partner, or JV partner, that type of thing. But I like to when I look at the borrower, I like to see experience level. Um, I want to know who they are. You know, I'm doing due diligence uh, 
and I, I tend to avoid newbies and I only lend in areas where I'm comfortable investing myself, where I have boots on the ground. Um, you know, like my son's a contractor, he could go finish a renovation for me if I needed it done, right? So I don't have to sweat that. In fact, it's the least of my worries if I pick up a property for 60, 65 cents on the dollar or less, because I might have a draw schedule there. So um, you want to know the borrower, you want to know the property, right? Like I said, I'm comfortable because I've been a realtor for over 30 years in my county or two county area, whereas you might not be. If you're not, get an appraisal. The borrower pays for the appraisal. Um, these, are, these are simple things to do. It's just you got to know what to do, right? And I know there's a ton of information on bigger pockets that could help you there. So I think if you're starting out, you want to get papered up right. You want to get an attorney. You want to get an appraisal. You want to pull title. You want to do the things that you need to do to basically dot your I's and cross your T's. Um, and when you're, you know, when I say know the property, hey, you got to know it. You might take it back someday. Um, and like I said, uh, so you want to get know the numbers. You want to be comfortable in value. You want to know the borrower. You want to pull the title. Um, you want to get the paperwork right, like I talked about. Oh, and then you want to be named insured, right? And I'm, you know, hey, maybe I'm leaving something out. I don't know. Um, so hopefully you guys like this info. I know I'm sometimes uh, I'm known to be all over the place. <laughs> so hopefully I'm not too far over the place. And, uh, you know, maybe we can touch on... Um, you know, so, some of the things we went over, but I do cover a lot of this in the book. Um, if you haven't picked up a copy of Real Estate Note Investing, uh, it's been out a little bit now. It, you can go to biggerpockets.com forward slash note investing and you get 20% off if you use the code live note investing. And by all means, try to get some of that bonus material. Uh, it is available in audiobook as well. Um, and uh, hopefully, if you like it, uh, give me some thumbs up, maybe share it, leave me a comment, leave me a review. It's the ultimate compliment. And I hope to continue going over more and more stuff with you guys. And uh, uh, I know one of the things, if you are interested in get diving deeper into the note business, uh, I know me and my partner, uh, Bob Paulus at uh, PPR, we do a call a Q&A call for note investors and, and note buyers. And our next one is July 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you go to our site, you can sign up, pprnoco.com. And um, I believe it's a Tuesday night, July 24th. And we pretty much, uh, sometimes we have a guest on, we cover a topic usually. We'll get into pretty much rolling up our sleeves doing, um, you know, mostly non-performing note deals. We go over case studies. We help people that are stuck in their deals, answer questions for them. And just to give you a perspective, even though I, I said my role is raising capital, and at one point I was an asset manager, but my partner, Bob, is the manager of all our asset managers that we have here at PPR. You know, we have over uh, like 30 employees. So, um, you know, he's bringing, you know, 11 years of experience in collections and can help you with your deals and any question. It's pretty rare that you have something Bob hasn't seen before. And uh, he's a great resource that we share with you guys from usually from 8 to 10 Eastern on the 24th of July. So if you get a chance and you want to find out, you know, even if you just want to listen in, we are limited to a thousand people on that call, but this is for people that are really doing deals. We go in, we go over people's deals, and then we also answer general questions towards the end of the call. Uh, as long as we got everybody's deals covered, we want to make sure that people that are actually, uh, you know, struggling with something or have questions that are real deal questions uh, before we get into the theoretical stuff. But, the, you know, you guys are all welcome to join us. Uh, like I said, July 24th, 8 p.m. Um, and those calls are usually not recorded. So if you can be on them and you really got no deals, try to be on those. And our next, um, the next, um, live presentation i'll be doing is actually july 11th because next week is independence day right and uh hopefully it's financial independence day for some of you i know it is for me uh but the um you, you know july 4th is next wednesday and i usually come on at 6 p.m eastern as i'm in philadelphia area so if you want my we want to join us next time our topic is going to be raising capital for notes in real estate so we're going to talk about raising capital which is my specialty. I don't mind talking about that. And um, hopefully you'll join us because I know everybody can use some additional capital and some uh, 
some unique strategies to raise money and some of the things that I've done over the years to help me um, you know, build that money list, which today is pretty robust for us. So I, I, I'm happy with the way things have been going and uh, would love to share that with you. I actually do cover some raising capital in the book. Um, and I know my buddy Matt Faircloth has a, a new book out on raising capital. By all means, if you get to the Bigger Pockets store at biggerpockets.com, pick up Matt's book too, because I know I read it and it's good. So um, by all means, giving a little shout out to my buddy, Matt Fairclough. So hopefully you guys can, uh, can do that. I don't know if I have time for any questions, maybe a quick one. Um, let me see if I got anybody. I know we covered a lot. Um, somebody say, hey, they picked up the book yesterday. Um, list of restrictions. I did mention the states. Um, Greetings from Belgium. Wow, that's crazy. Cool that you guys joined. Um, somebody said, is there a lot of capital needed to get started before we even make the first purchase of a note? The answer is no. Um, the only reason we used our own capital in the very beginning, and we didn't have a ton of capital in the beginning, was we wanted to make sure that it worked, right? So we used our own money before we started raising money. So like I said, we only bought four loans. It wasn't a lot of money. I mean, it takes some money. Now, nobody says it has to be your money either, right? So keep that in mind. I mean, you can, um, you know, when I look at PPR over the years, the bulk of the capital is not our money. I mean, me and my partners have some money invested, but when we really think of, of what we have deployed and how much capital we've raised, uh, we're pretty small in the scheme of things. It, most of the money has been OPM, other people's capital. So, um, hey, my buddy Martin. Hey, what's up, buddy? Um, let me see if I can see you there. I don't know if I can see your message. Um, hello from Kansas. Um, but somebody did mention the states. Could I go over those again? I think is what your question was. I know the buy and hold states. The only one I'm questionable about is Maine. I, I know Maine has something there. I don't know if it's with short sales or something. But it's really Merlin, Kentucky, Kansas, Illinois, Georgia, Connecticut, Alabama, Minnesota, Mississippi, Nebraska, New Jersey, West Virginia. And I know there's two states that require a license to sell, which is Florida and Wisconsin. So a lot of these states require you know, either a buy and hold license or a license to sell. Um, so even if you have it with a servicer, you might need an additional license. And you're seeing this regulatory environment has changed pretty significantly. So it's something to, um, to keep in mind, right? So that is happening out there. Let me see if I can see if I can find a couple more questions coming in here. Um, cheers from Germany. Could you buy a mortgage from a creditor when the debtor has filed a charge bankruptcy? Uh, 13? Yes, sure. Why not? Um, so these are some interesting questions. Um, who else do we have here from Phoenix? Cheers from Miami. Actually, I was just in Disney. Had a great trip. I'm all sunburned a little bit, but uh, you know how it is. Chicago's here. I know I was out in Chicago land at Bree Schmidt's event. It was a great time. So hopefully uh, get back out to Chicago soon. Let me see who else we have. Um, well, listen, um, definitely like to wrap it up for you guys. I don't want to keep you all night. I know I could talk about notes uh, till kingdom come. But um, like I said, if you haven't picked up a copy, by all means, try to grab one. We do talk about a lot of these things in the book. I know, I believe it's in chapter four where I talk about how I got started. And then I kind of walk you through. Some of it's a little autobiographical. It's not really necessarily a how-to book, but it is a great overview and introduction into the note business. It's hard to do a how-to book on every aspect of the note business. It would be like trying to do uh, a real estate investing book to cover every type of real estate investing. It, it's impossible, right? But we do a, get a pretty good introduction, a good overview. Uh, we talk about a lot of strategies, especially for real estate investors, how they can incorporate notes into their world um, and hopefully build more wealth quicker and exponentially. And, that, and that's really what my goal was, was to introduce the concept of note investing to a lot of real estate investors, especially the folks uh, like you guys on Bigger Pockets. Um, so like I said, the next live event that I'll be doing for you guys will be on July 11th, Raising Capital for Notes and Real Estate, same time, uh, 6 p.m. Eastern. 
And uh, if somebody wants to roll up their sleeves and find out more about notes and has some more noting questions, uh, you can join us on July 24th at 8 p.m. Eastern. If you go to pprnoco.com, uh, get on our website, and uh, by all means, um, try to get the bonus material. Some great strategies there we talk about on how to buy notes, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys soon. Take care now.